Let's open our Bibles this morning to Ephesians 5. We move on in our series in the book of Ephesians. We have moved on to chapter 5. We're about to uh, finish this book, just one more chapter. There's lots that's very important to cover uh, and to address in this book, especially the message that uh, we begin today. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> We're going to read verses 1 through 7 this morning. And the Word of God reads, Ephesians 5 beginning in verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of things. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we stand here today and we desire, long, and need to hear a word from you. May your Holy Spirit impart truth from your word to us this morning. May I simply be a vessel, Lord. Forgive me of my sins and let us be faithful to the word uh, that we receive today that we may also become doers of it. Thank you, Jesus, for your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> amen. And amen. We have entitled uh, this message, which is part of the series in, on Ephesians 5, the series that covers the topic, The Spirit-Filled Life. We have entitled now this portion of this series, Holiness Ambition. Holiness Ambition. I am sure that we all, all humans, have certain ambitions, do we not? We're talking about ambitions in a healthy sense. For example, uh, young people have ambitions of getting married one day. We have ambitions and goals such as going to school, getting a better job, having children one day, maybe starting a business. For others, it may be at some point buying a house, etc., etc. We all have ambitions. The question for us this morning, what about in the spiritual realm? What about in the spiritual dimension? Do we have any ambitions there? Do I have any ambitions in the spiritual realm? Today, I want you to ask yourself, what are your ambitions for your personal life? Such as the ones that we have mentioned today. I am sure that you have ambitions such as these for your life beginning 2014. But now I want you, I want you if you haven't, I want you to think, wait a second, have I forgotten to think about my spiritual life and any ambitions in that aspect? Any goals that I have thought of for my spiritual life this year, 
just perhaps, um, not perhaps, I'm sure that, if this thought has not crossed your mind for this year, or recently, or at any time uh, in the last uh, few months, that is an indication of how your spiritual life is. We should have ambitions for our spiritual lives. Do I ever think about the state of my spiritual life? When was the last time that you reflected and thought about the condition, the state of your spiritual life, your progress therein? When was the last time that you thought, evaluated, examined your progress in your spiritual life or the lack thereof? Do I have a holiness ambition? The main idea that we shall be working with in this passage is that the spirit-filled life is characterized by holiness ambition. The life of the believer that is spirit-filled has a desire, has a goal, has an interest at heart, that he burns with, that he longs for. And I want to submit to you this morning that that desire, that interest is a holiness interest, a holiness desire, a holiness ambition. What is the meaning of holiness? Well, what is the meaning of holiness ambition? In the main idea of your outline, we go on to explain what it means. It means an increasing controlling desire and effort in the direction of sanctification. An increasing controlling desire and effort in the direction of holiness or sanctification, which means separation and purification from sin and the world unto greater obedience and service to the Lord. What is a holiness ambition? Is that desire in me that longs to have my will and my ways more and more yielded to the will and the ways of my Savior, more and more separated from the world, sin, the flesh, and its ways, that I may be more and more conformed to the image of Christ. That is, I want to say, the the ruling characteristic of the Spirit-filled life. If that ambition is not in our bosom, we're not Spirit-filled. We may be Spirit-owned. We may be children of God. But we are not spirit-filled. And what we are exhorting the church through these series of, uh, this series of messages is that we seek to be spirit-filled and that we may understand what that means. We have a quote by John Calvin on the top of the outline. You all, hopefully you have the outline this morning. And atop the page... You have the following quote. People change their ways. Let me say that first part again. Where there is repentance and reconciliation with God, people change their ways. Those who fail to do this have no place in God's kingdom. Let's look at the passage that we read this morning. The Apostle Paul has already called us to be imitators of God. He has grounded that calling in what we spoke last Sunday and said, the dear children identity, that we should consider ourselves to be dear children of God, beloved of God, forgiven of God, accepted of God. And as children of God, it is our right It is our destiny to become like the Son, to imitate God, to imitate God in Christ Jesus. 
And then he goes on in verse 3, even be named among you as is fitting for saints. The Apostle Paul begins to unpack what it means to be an imitator of God. He begins to unpack how children of God, beloved children of God, are called to walk. The Spirit-filled life, holiness, ambition, desires, and strives, number one, for purity, purity in our lives. So the Apostle Paul tells us some things that we are to separate ourselves from, that we are to watch for so that we will not be associated with them. The spirit-filled life in our holiness ambition begins to develop a hatred of moral impurity or uncleanness. It increasingly hates and rejects all sin. How do I know that I am being spirit-filled? How do I know that I am growing in step with the Spirit of God? I grow in my desire for purity. I grow in the intensity of my hatred for the opposite, for impurity, for sin. In this case, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul mentioned fornication, being that the context of Gentiles was one where fornication was rampant. Now, by fornication in this context, the word is pornia. The Greek word that we find in verse 3 for fornication is, guess what? Pornia, from which we derive our English word pornography. This phrase pornia includes all aspects of sexual immor immorality, all aspects of illicit sexual relationships. So the Apostle Paul is, is saying to believers, is saying to Gentile Christians particularly, as he addresses um, uh, believers in, in this letter to the Ephesians, let fornication, let pornea not even be named among you. This is something that you are to disassociate yourself from, break from, not participate in. <coughs> and then he goes on to say, to say, and all uncleanness. The word for uncleanness denotes filth, impurity, defilement with sin. So fornication, knowing that it is a context in which Gentiles uh, have an issue with, but then he addresses not just fornication, but all manners, all kinds of defilement with sin, all kinds of impurity in your life. And then he adds to this list fornication, uncleanness, which becomes now a broad a broad word that catches all kinds of um, transgressions and sins of God's holy law. But now he specifically mentions covetousness. He says fornication, uncleanness, or covetousness. In your outline, you also have the um, explanation for this word covetousness. It's the Greek word pleonexia, and it's this. It's a desire for having more. It's a desire for having more. It's greediness. So the Apostle Paul is saying, as beloved children of God, I want you to abstain from pornea, from sexual immorality. I want you to look at all different ways in which your holiness is, under da is it's in danger of becoming stained of you becoming uh, impure, stained by the sin of the flesh and this world. And then I want you to look at how in your life of um, oftentimes in the flesh sinning, I want you to pay close attention as to how in your flesh oftentimes we experience a desire for more and more being insatisfied in ourselves. So he says, 
sexual immorality, be mindful of that. Um, look at all manners in which you can become defiled, polluted with sin. And then notice how the way of sin is one that then those desires in you are never satisfied and call out for more, more, and more. And that is covetousness. Uh, this covetousness, even though the context here may have an allusion to sexual sins, it is broader. And it is anything that is an illicit object of our desire that we are greedy for, hungry for, can never get enough of, and want more and more and more of. As is fitting for saints. Let me take you to some uh, scriptures to support what we have just read. Let me take you to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and see what the Apostle Peter has to say on this topic. 1 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> in verse 11, he says, Beloved, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So these desires, these unruly desires that the Apostle Paul has talked about, whether it be in the area of sexual immorality or in any other area, it, which in our flesh becomes this insatiable appetite for more and more of that which we unruly and in a disobedi disobedient fashion desire, the apostle uh, Peter is saying, I beg you, abstain from that because those desires are warring against your soul. These desires are in opposition against your spirit. These desires will get in the middle and in the way of your spiritual growth. So one of the things that we could ask ourselves this morning is, <clears throat> when we look at our lives, <clears throat> are we being controlled by some of these desires in the flesh? Are we being driven by the insatiable appetite for more, whether it be in the area of pornea, sexual immorality, or in any other area in which we're being defiled with sin? And do we see then the quest in our lives and the impulse of the flesh to want more and more and to obsess with that desire that has lodged in my mind and that is now controlling my walk. Peter says, I beg you, abstain from that. I beg you, separate yourself from that. You're a sojourner. You're a pilgrim. You're passing by. Oh, it is understandable for those that don't have the Spirit of God. You look at the world and you see how they live. They want more and more of whatever it is that they desire. Do they not? What is the money? They want more of it. More and more and more. That is the covetousness that the Apostle Paul is talking about in Ephesians 5. What is it? Sex? They want more and more and more. Pornography. Hardcore. Hardcore. More. Keep pushing the envelope. What is it? Fame, power, more. And more. Do you notice the pattern? Do you notice the pattern of greediness? It's not just greedy for money. It manifests itself. This admonition of the Apostle Paul for, um, to watch for covetousness manifests itself in any area of defilement in the flesh that is intent now on seeking more and more of it. That is the life of the flesh. By the way, that characterizes unregenerate life. That characterizes life that is not born from above. The life that is not born from above is characterized by greediness in the flesh, by an uncontrolled, 
unruly desire that keeps pushing you for more in the different manifestations of the defilement of your flesh. There's no stopping them. <clears throat> By contrast, the life of the Spirit. Notice the contrast now. <clears throat> the life of the Spirit is one in which we now grow in a desire for more and more of what? Of the Spirit of God, of obedience to His will, of getting to know Him more, of delighting in Him, of service in Him. These two <coughs> are mutually exclusive. <coughs> when you have one, <coughs> the other one is absent. When you're growing in the one, you're decreasing in the other. Let me show you what Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 14. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 14 says, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, let's begin reading in verse 13 to bring up an additional point. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter <clears throat> says, I want you to be sober. What is the meaning of being sober? It's the opposite of being drunk. What is the meaning of being sober? Sober, I want you to be alert. I want you to be focused. Now, how do we come to this state of being sober and alert? We are resting upon the grace that is to be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We are resting on the promises of God that still remain future, that have been promised to me as my inheritance, as a kingdom of God that I will inherit and as a child of God that has a future outlook that looks to the promises of God for my life, now there will be a particular orientation of my life. There will be now a characteristic to my life that goes like this. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts. What is, what's, what's Peter saying there? Do not be content. Do not settle for the old desires. <clears throat> Do not be content. Do not settle. Do not go with the old desires you used to have when you didn't have the Spirit of God. You will experience those desires, but as obedient children, you're not to settle for that life because you're no longer somebody that is in the flesh if you are a child of God. It says, not conforming yourselves to the form and lust, as in your ignorance. <coughs> we didn't know any better, did we? <clears throat> when we were without Christ, what else are we going to do in this world but have more of this world? It only makes sense. If there is no God, if there is no Christ, if, there's not, if there are not better things, if there is not a better kingdom, if there is not the promise of eternal life with all the rewards of sharing in the holiness and in the life of God and the life of Christ, then it makes sense for us to indulge all kinds of appetites in our flesh. Paul himself says it in the book of Corinthians. If there is no resurrection, let us what? Let us eat. Let us drink. Let us be merry for tomorrow we die. Oh, but because of the resurrection, because we have an inheritance with Christ, because we look forward to better things, because we have been changed to desire better things, then it says, do not be conformed to the former lust. Do not be conformed to pornea. Do not be conformed. Do not settle. Don't, don't think it's normal to live in a life of sexual immorality. Don't settle for that. It's not normal. That's the way you used to live. But as a child of God now, it is not what you're called to. It is not normal. It is not who you are. 
the Apostle Paul says, Peter is saying here as well, do not settle for your defilement. <clears throat> oh, we're all staying with sin in our daily walk, are we not? <clears throat> yes, we are. The life filled with the Spirit is one that feels the weight of that and the pain of that. When was the last time that you felt the weight and the pain of the stains that you pick up on your daily basis as you walk in this world and your flesh gets the better of you? If you're not feeling the weight of that, if you're not feeling the pain of that, if there isn't something that in you repels those stains and repels sin and the defilement that it brings to your life, if you have none of that, I tell you, you need to examine your spiritual life. Because wherever the Spirit of God is, there is conviction of sin. Wherever the Spirit of God is, there is and awareness of what pleases him. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter then goes on to say, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 5, Be imitators of God. Who is God? What is God? He's spirit, and he is holy. <clears throat> He's holy. So if he is holy, and his son was holy, then what is our calling to be like? Both apostles agree. Our calling is to be holy. Oh, we talk about grace, and we should, and we must, and we will continue to talk about grace. But one of the things you're going to realize is that grace goes with holiness. Grace does not go with unholiness or licentiousness or immorality or negligence in our spiritual lives. Whoever believes that to walk in grace and to grow in grace somehow allows for negligence for disregard to our walk of sanctification does not understand grace and has missed the boat on grace big time. Big time. Because when I open this Bible, I see the heralds of grace talking about grace and then immediately leading me on to a path of holiness and a path of sanctification. That's why it's so important that we get our theology from where? From the Word of God. So the Apostle Peter says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am <coughs> holy. <coughs> And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear. Fear of what, you may say, if I'm already saved. There are some people that are grace talkers who cannot incorporate this part of the biblical message. They cannot, if you cannot incorporate the language of fear, into your spiritual life, you have, again, I want to say it again, you have missed the boat on grace. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the ministry. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what great um, accomplishments you may have had in the ministry. It only means that you have settled for a lesser ground because the Bible says, that we are to conduct ourselves here in fear. Does that mean that I live in fear that God will zap me and that God will disown me tomorrow or that I will lose my salvation? No. By no means it means that. By no means it means that. But it means that we must walk 
in the fear of reverence of one that desires to do the will of the Father. That desires to do the will of the Son. That desires to do the will of the Holy Spirit. That reads this Bible <clears throat> and doesn't just take pieces of it, but reads this Bible and continues to cherish this Word. And continues to say, I want to hear the whole counsel of God. <clears throat> I want to be found not pleasing men, but I want to make sure that when I end my life, I end my life on what the Bible had to say to me and what the will of God was that is said to me. That is why we have a legacy, a reformed legacy that comes from the Puritans that did not miss the boat on the connection between justification and sanctification. The reason I say that is because there are some reform camps today that are missing the boat on the connection between justification and sanctification. What do you mean by that, Pastor? What I mean by that is what, Paul, what Peter says here, be holy as the Father who begot you is holy. What I mean by that is what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, shall we sin that grace may increase? May never be. How can you who have been united with Christ continue now in a life of sin? Impossible. The apostle Paul would say it. And the Puritans knew that. The reformers of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, they knew that. And they left us this legacy of making emphasis on grace at the same time that that grace teaches us. As Paul says to Timothy, that the grace of God teaches us to live soberly and modestly in this world, denying all ungodliness. That's where the grace of God teaches us to live with fear before God. What fear? The fear that I will displease Him. <clears throat> if your grace walk is such that when you sin, you have no compulsion about what you've done. It, when you sin, you say, well, it, this is all going to get fixed when I get to my prayer tonight. Don't worry about it. I don't need to. This is not a problem. There's nothing wrong with me. There's no fear. There's no, there should be no anxiety in me about this path and this habitual uh, process of sinning in my life. If your grace understanding leads you to that understanding, again, I want to say it, you've missed the boat on grace. Because the grace of God will lead us to fear. The grace of God will lead us to say, Oh, Father, I don't like what I'm seeing, what you're showing me now. Oh, Father, I don't like it. I hate, oh, Father, when I behave like this or think like this or even talk like this, oh, Father. Oh, Father, I feel really falling apart right now, oh, God, because I have disobeyed you. Father, I need to make it right. I need for this to be purged from me. I need to make this thing in my life right, right now. Oh God, if the grace of God is not leading you there, there's something amiss with your understanding of the grace of God. It says, conduct, live yourselves throughout your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. <clears throat> Let me take you now to 1 Thessalonians. Correction in your outline. It says 2 Thessalonians. The correction is 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <coughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul again has a plea for purity. The Apostle Paul makes an impassioned plea 
for holiness in 1 Thessalonians 4. And he says, beginning in verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. What's he talking about? Abound more and more. That you should abound more and more. The Christian life, the spirit-filled life is one of advance and growth. Pastor, but there are times when we're not growing. Yes, there are times like that. But it's not okay. The problem is when we say, well, I'm not growing, but that's okay because I'm secure in Christ. That's okay because I'm in grace. That's okay because I grew up in the church. That's okay because when I was 10 years old, I said the sinner's prayer. That's okay because I do this or this or that in church. So that's okay. No, it's not okay. You're disobeying the will of God. You should be living in fear and reverence to the will of God that says you should abound more and more. In what? Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. You see that? Our ambition, our holiness ambition should be saying, Lord, how can I more and more walk in such a way that pleases you? Do you aim to please the Lord? Do you realize how your life is being defiled on on an everyday basis? I'm talking about the defilement of your daily walk. I'm talking about what Jesus said to Peter when he said, Peter, I need to wash your feet. No, you're not going to wash me. Peter, you're already clean. Peter, you're clean already, but I still need to wash you. But why do you need to wash me? I'm kind of paraphrasing that dialogue now. It says, Peter, unless I wash your feet, you don't have part in my kingdom. Notice that Jesus had already told them, you're all clean already, yet there is a further washing that I need to do of you. Jesus was talking about the cleansing and the washing that is daily, that is practical, that it's a life of sanctification, that is a mark of a Christian. A Christian is characterized by daily being cleansed, washed in his daily walk, shaking off the dust that we pick along the way, shaking off the defilement, the stains that cling to us, the stain that has arisen from our flesh, and the power of the blood was given to us to justify us so that we would be declared guilty by faith alone, by grace alone, and the power of the blood has also been given to us so that we may on a daily basis be transformed, be renewed, be cleansed from practical daily defilement and stains in our life. <clears throat> he who is justified will be sanctified in, di- in diverse degrees And levels, there's different levels of growth, there's different levels of maturity, but make no mistake about it. He who has been justified will enter the path of sanctification. What path is that? The path of growth in obedience to the will of God. The path of growth in desiring To please the Lord. As a matter of fact, that's one of the ways that you know that you've been born again. If your profession of Christ is one, you say, oh, I believe in Christ. But there's not the slightest hint that you desire to please and to obey His will. Your profession is empty. Your profession means nothing. It is just that. It is a profession of faith, and no one is saved by a profession of faith. Let me say that again. No one is saved by a profession of faith. We are saved by genuine faith. We're saved by true faith. We're saved by faith, not the profession or the articulation verbally, 
of that faith. That's why there are many that have risen their hands. That's why there are many that have taken a step forward. They made a profession of faith, but they were never born again. And unless we, we be born again, we shall never see the kingdom of God. And he who is born again, he who has genuine faith in different ways, degrees, measures, finds himself on this path of desiring to abound more and more in pleasing the Lord. Oh, how many obstacles beset us? How many hindrances we find in this way, do we not? How many times we trip and fall? Oh, how much weakness we see in ourselves along the way. Ah, but take heart, saint. Take heart, you're in pilgrimage. And what the Lord has started in you, he will complete. He started with your work where by faith he justified you. And he's intent on conforming you to Christ. He won't quit on it. He will conform you to Christ. He will sanctify you. That is his will for you. I want to finish with 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, the first part, part of verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. The will of God is not a mystery. <clears throat> the will of God has been revealed to us. What is the will of God? Our sanctification. The Spirit of God will fill us so that we may have a holiness ambition, a sanctification ambition that we may desire more and more to please Him. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, <coughs> help us, Lord, now that You have worked in us to will and to do according to your good pleasure. Help us now to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And in that working out, be further affirmed and established that we are your children and that you have begun a mighty work of holiness, of Christ-likeness in our lives. Father, I pray that you may help us to be cleansed in our daily walk. Lord, we all stand here acknowledging our sins before you. I want to be cleansed, O oh God. I want to abound more and more. I want to do better today than I did yesterday and tomorrow. And if it is not so tomorrow, I rise up again to say, Father, do it this day. Help me. I need you. Help me get in line, O oh Father, with your spirit and the way that you would have me walk. And Father, help us continue in this series to learn what you would have us learn, Father, about this process of being spirit-filled, of growing in our sanctification. Father, it is for your honor and glory that we pray and that we seek to do these things we humble ourselves before you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen, amen and Amen. God bless you. See you on Wednesday.